yeah, so we have 45 minutes. I don't intend to talk for the entire 45 minutes, uh, but um, probably 20 or so. Um, and I'm hoping as participants join that they will also uh, say who they are, um, what institution or what, what place you're, you're coming from, um, if you wish to share that. <clears throat> and as well, I'd be really interested to hear um, what your particular uh, background or um, expertise is in, whether that's in um, museum in collections themselves, AV collections, um, or you're, if you're coming from an educational background, or um, if you're just a student who's interested, whatever the case is, that will that'll be really helpful to me also to know um, later when we, when we have a time for discussion. Uh, what, who's, who's in the room actually? Um, yeah, so I, um, I'm Nicole Emmenecker and I work for the Netherlands Institute for Sound and Vision. Um, I've been there for just about two years and mm -hmm. I'm a product manager there. So I have a different portfolio of, of yeah. projects that I work on. A lot of them are yeah. directly related to Europeana, um, which is uh, fantastic for me. And one of the bigger kind of products that I, that I, that I manage is uh, EU Screen. Um, so I'm going to be here to go through, uh, basically what EU screen is all about, um, some of the projects we've done in the past, uh, and specifically then turning to look at all the things that we're now doing, um, presently and in the future, uh, with a focus on education and, um, working more closely with, with educators. Um, there's a few different initiatives we have going on at the moment. Some of them really closely linked with Europeana, others that are a bit more um, uh, slightly differently shaped and formed. Uh, all of them are European wide. Um, so that's uh, important that everything we do does resonate and does uh, have a place in every, uh, every country that, that we represent. Um, so from those projects and those kind of initiatives, I'll then talk about some of the um, specific educational work we're doing. Um, and as we're in the middle of a lot of this stuff, uh, I can give you a bit of insight into some things that we've uh, felt as challenges or things that we've been learning along the way and some of the next steps, as well as some notes, hopefully for you also to ponder and for us to maybe discuss. So what exactly is EU Screen? Uh, EU Screen is a, is a network and essentially we are here, um, we're a group of independent uh, audiovisual heritage uh, collection holders who um, represent uh, a network, but we also are a foundation, and that foundation is um, founded and grounded in the Netherlands, uh, hence the administrative kind of hub being at the Netherlands Institute for Sound and Vision. But as such, as a network, we are about facilitating online access to uh, audiovisual history, and we do this with the intention of providing both rich, meaning well-curated, well-told, well-contextualized um, material, but also robust, meaning that it is, uh, it will stand up. It's, uh, you know, the metadata is, is um, the metadata is clear, the, the objects are high quality, all around the digital content itself is, is strong. Um, and we also, at another level, we also advocate for the use of this audiovisual history to integrate it into educational curriculums, into, um, into research at the kind of higher education level and within uh, media production as well. So um, uh, broadcast and, and whatnot and, and artistic engagement as well. And then of course, there's a general public who happen to have a particular interest in audiovisual um, heritage material. So in general, the idea is of course, beneath it all is to uh, find ways to actively engage with um, the history of Europe, the cultural memory of Europe um, at national level with, within all the individual network members, as well as a, a more broader European level. So this here is a funny little chart that kind of details the history of EU Screen over the man, many years. Um, the, the founders of EU Screen are proud to say that it's actually older than Europeana, which is, yeah, which is true. Uh, started 20 years ago now nearly, um, and has progressed over the years into something called Video Active, which some of the old schoolers, I think, in the crowd will know about, uh, and the connection with Europeana then beginning around 2007. Um, and EU Screen has had the privilege and been 
quite fortunate to be funded under um, many of the kind of core uh, Europeana programs, such as the current running um, Europeana Digital Service Inf Infrastructure, the DSI. Um, and we've also been part of many kind of uh, generic services projects um, as they currently are recognized uh, over the years. This that gets us up to the point we are now. There's a lot of other projects that we have running now, which I will get into detail uh, in just a few minutes. So who are we? Uh, we're basically a network of 60 uh, organizations. And these are organizations and institutions that have some, uh, obviously have an interest in AV uh, cultural heritage. Most of them are broadcasters themselves with, it, with that, that house their own collections. Um, some are, are not. Uh, there's a, a, a wide variety of partners from across, from across Europe. Um, there's different tiers of, of kind of participation. We have some partners that are able and willing to um, provide a participation fee, which helps us to keep things, keep things running, um, while others are just associate partners who want to be part of the network, um, but um, just remain kind of one circle outside. Of course, there's not only the members, but there's also a, a board that kind of keeps things in line. And that's uh, the six people that you see pictured here today. Um, this is uh, Alessandra from, um, Cent oh, I won't attempt to my terrible French, Centre National de l'Audiovisuel, uh, Berber, uh, who's based at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. Um, my lovely colleague, Johan, uh, at the at Sonavision. Uh, our favorite uh, star, uh, uh, Maya from um, Finna in Poland, uh, Marco, of course, from Lucha in, uh, in Italy, and myself as the um, Participants Council Chair on the board. So we oversee the activities, we make decisions about um, potential projects, uh, policy, um, and kind of keep the, the thrust of the, of the foundation and the, the network going. Many of you might not know, but we actually also publish um, a journal, an academic journal. Uh, this is called VIEW, and it's managed by one of my colleagues, um, Ninke, at, at Sun and Vision. Um, the current issue is on broadcasting health, tele televisual health of, of some sort, so a very timely, um, timely topic about health and, and broadcasting. Um, it's been, uh, it's very established in the academic sector, and also gives us a, um, a strong presence in the kind of research and higher education um, sector. So we're very happy that, uh, that we have this. The, uh, the website address is there, so please do check it out if you have an interest in, in these types of publications. But of course, the core of our activity is the um, EU screen. Oops, excuse me. is the actual euscreen.eu .eu, um, website portal. Um, the page uh, is houses um, a good amount of, of videos, uh, which are well curated into uh, topics, um, easily searchable by uh, country, location, um, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a, the idea is that it's a, it's a well curated source for um, quickly and easily finding uh, material um, about uh, European uh, audiovisual history. So some of the features, this is what an item page looks like as an example. Um, you'll see here uh, the video itself that's, that's playable directly on the site. Um, a bit of a summary, um, who the provider is, production year, et cetera, et cetera. So pretty standard kind of um, presentation of the, of the content. More on this uh, uh, also to come in just a moment. Uh, video posters allows you to also be a bit creative yourself and, and bring together different things that you like on the site. Um, and, uh, you know, save and highlight things that you particularly want to uh, either share or save for later. Um, a recent uh, enhancement or recent rather um, huge kind of milestone for us was the integration and development of uh, a universal media player. Um, this came out of a, a Europeana project called Europeana Media. And the, uh, the player itself, the idea um, is that it's interoperable, unified, 
and usable for any kind of time-based media. Um, what the player features, what previous versions didn't, is that there's a, capabilities now to not only um, play videos, but also to embed them in uh, external sites, to add annotations yourself um, as a user, um, private, private annotations for your, for your own notes, uh, to create playlists of videos, um, as well as to add subtitles. Um, all these features are not rolled out on every video um, on, on the EU screen site, but this is something that we're working on. They're currently in full function on the, uh, on the Lucha um, uh, collections. And there is also a version of, the, um, of this media player uh, being in use now um, on the European site itself. So just a kind of a bit of a view about the reach that we have and uh, the community that we uh, engage not only um, within the network, but externally. Uh, the portal has nearly 30,000 visits per month, uh, no, uh, views per month, excuse me, and um, just about 13,000 visitors per month. Um, we have a, a strong Facebook group uh, with 3,000 followers and um, some good uh, tweet presence as well with 2,000 some followers on Twitter. And the core activities and the reason why, of course, that we're part of uh, the digital service infrastructure and other kind of key or piano projects is that we are the main aggregator for um, audiovisual um, content to uh, to European and not the there's a separate uh, aggregator, of course, the European Film Gateway for film material. We focus on um, AV collections. So um, this is just a reminder of kind of the overview of, of, uh, of aggregation and um, where we fit along with um, European Film Gateway and, of course, European Sounds as the sound um, aggregator into the structure. Um, our collection on the EU screen site itself is about 60,000. Uh, which is small in comparison to the amount that we aggregate directly to Europeana, um, which is about, I think it's actually a million um, at the moment, um, and certainly always growing. So a little bit about our kind of thoughts and plans and hopes and dreams um, to get us into how we really started to focus on, on education. Um, as a board, uh, and with input from the entire network, um, we developed a strategic plan over the course of 2019 into 2020 that would help us to guide and um, direct our plans for projects and, and where we wanted to get involved for the next few years. And kind of at the core of it was the realization that we really are, um, as a foundation and as a network, um, at the connecting point between, um, you know, European audiovisual content between the various different digital platforms to display that content. Um, we have a hand in the research uh, world and, and a hand in, in the education world. So we have really quite, uh, we're in a good position to be um, um, connecting and advocating for each of those uh, areas um, across all of those areas. Um, and in particular, on behalf of our network, on, on behalf of those, those uh, collection holders, to champion the specific needs of, um, of those content holders so that they can deliver the best and richest and most robust quality um, audiovisual heritage. Um, and in that way, remain relevant, you know, in, in, the, in the current current world, in the current um, digital first kind of uh, uh, universe. Um, constantly being sure that we can champion um, the needs of our, of our content holders and making sure that we can find ways for them to get engaged um, and stay informed. Um, and, by, and one of the key ways we do that is by collaborating, by innovating, by coming up with project ideas, by joining project consortiums. Um, so I'll give you a brief kind of overview of some of the things we've done in the last few years. Some of the projects we've been starring in, some of the projects we've been um, taking part in. So one of the ones that uh, dates back to 2017, 2019 is the European Migration Project, and that um, has come up earlier today as well. Um, this featured a lot of really rich, beautiful content that came in and some really innovative use of uh, things like the collection days, um, as well as helping to en enrich metadata and provide um, some providers with uh, an opportunity to uh, aggregate to European uh, for the first time. Uh, the European Media Player, with, with the major um, output in uh, the beginning of 2020, in March 2020, of the integration of the Universal Media Player 
um, which is a work in progress uh, still and will continue to be developed and um, adapted and iterated. Uh, but at this point, it's, uh, it's a major um, step forward for us to have this, um, this really rich and uh, universal uh, media player in place on the site. The European XX project, which is currently um, uh, running and will end at the end, towards the end of 2021. Uh, EUScreen's involvement here relates to, of course, um, we're coordinating, uh, Sun Vision is coordinator of the project itself, but um, there's a lot of focus here on innovative ways of, of presenting and creating content for the Europeana site. Um, there's a series of podcasts that have been really, that will be released, uh, video blogs, um, uh, the concept of engaging ambassadors of change. So there's a lot of innovation on that level, but as well as also uh, enriching and providing um, uh, 2.5 million, enriching 2.5 million metadata uh, records uh, as part of the process as well. So a lot of content as well as uh, quality improvements for, for European XX, specifically related to the 20th century. Um, so now more specifically about some of the education work that we've been doing or kind of turning towards um, over the last few years as well. Um, and how EU Screen has tried to put itself at the front of the classroom. And which classroom is that? Of course, the Europeana classroom, which is the online platform um, that uh, is uh, run by our, our, our colleague at Europeana, um, Isabel. Um, the reason, this is just a brief overview of the classroom. I won't go into detail or speak on behalf of it, but just to say that there, it is a rather rich, it's an amazingly rich resource. And it's something that we realized that could be a really perfect match for us to uh, connect with, to be able to um, use as a, as, a, as a way to show what, what's possible for um, AV archives. Uh, and oh, uh, Right. So anyway, so um, knowing that we could, that this would be a place that we could really showcase material specifically aimed at educators, at students, um, this was a good focus for us and a good way for us to kind of use this as a, as a inspiration and collaboration, um, collaboration tool. So um, the site itself is uh, ever growing and ever expanding, and we are aiming to be much bigger presence, um, meaning AV material, a much bigger presence on the classroom. So some of the projects then that have been um, underway. Um, uh, yes, so reviewing European stories, which ran um, until last year, um, was a project together with Euroclio, led by our um, partners in uh, at Finna. And the idea of this was to really promote critical thinking amongst high school students and teachers in how they look and engage with um, European history. And there's now a section on the uh, EU Screen website <clears throat> dedicated specifically to the outcomes and to the resources um, that came out of this project. Another one that we've uh, that started recently at the beginning of um, 2021 is this Erasmus Plus funded project. Um, which will, over the next three years, develop a, a training program for both, um, yeah, for basically, again, aiming at students, um, young professionals, to also really think about, you know, their engagement with um, critical thinking as well. So how can you uh, search uh, and explore multimedia data? How can you tell stories with that data? And how can you track and actually debunk uh, misinformation when it comes up? very ambitious project and one that we are incredibly um, grateful to be part of. Um, again, also housed and featured on the EU screen uh, website. Um, a project called European Subtitle, getting back to the connection with the classroom specifically. Um, this project kicked off last week uh, and will feature uh, seven content providers, some of them, um, seven AV content providers, um, some of them new to EU screen, um, some of them um, old friends, but all in all, we hope to promote and provide uh, 6,000 new um, AV objects as, as one major outcome and really work um, with the cultural heritage uh, sector um, to promote and support and educate around 
um, you know, automatic speech recognition, machine learning, and um, harness the tools of AI for uh, a massive amount of closed captioning and subtitling um, to be then uh, uh, presented on the European website. And specifically within the work that we're doing in the kind of editorial um, part of the project is working with um, European Classroom again to uh, develop learning scenarios to also uh, promote language learning using the CLIL, the Content Language Integrated um, Learning uh, Methodologies. So taking the idea of um, multilinguality, um, language learning, and, and playing with it, expanding with it, and using the basis of the AV material and the, um, these kind of clips of videos um, as the kind of creative uh, impetus for that. Um, as I mentioned before, yes, we are um, uh, one of the aggregators that is in, funded um, under the DSI. And over the last, it's just now going to be, um, uh, the next year will begin again in September. But over the last year, we've looked at and focused on um, both a campaign and a, and a task force to um, specifically look at increasing awareness and capacity building um, around um, you know, working with AV material in education, facing both the CHIs, but also then working with teachers and educators um, to make sure that we understand their needs and that we're addressing the needs of their students as well. Um, so the campaign itself is currently underway and will include um, a, you know, a video that can hopefully then be shared far and wide um, to uh, show what we've done as well as encourage others to, uh, to join. Um, and rethink how they're, if possible, what kind of what they can do to provide more material for education. Um, I'll dive into a bit more into the task force now, uh, but essentially the task force, the focal point of the task force was to investigate from many different angles how audiovisual material can be made more readily available for um, specifically for the European classroom environment. So with that in mind, um, the reasons for even setting up this task force was in response to various different uh, recommendations that have come from other task forces before. Um, and so we're following in the, in the footsteps of these and making sure that the, the work that we did within this task force uh, is relevant and does, does resonate. So some of the recommendations included um, you know, that uh, digital heritage materials should be relevant um, for educational purposes. Um, it's, it's an obvious one, but of course, uh, needs to be uh, noted um, and that it should be learning outcomes um, that it that digital heritage material should be discoverable it should be um, and these are these are specific recommendations for how to work with the education sector uh, to make it easier for those teachers and, le and, and learners uh, in their day-to-day -day work um, so discoverability was big as well um, that if, if you can't if you know an educator or um, a museum you know, worker working with education can't find the material, they're not going to use it in the classroom. Um, that there is also, you know, a sufficient context um, about where the material comes from um, so that it can be trusted. Uh, and that, of course, the quality is high enough. We're used to now being, you know, inundated with videos that are that are very high quality. Um, and in the specific case of, yeah, of audiovisual, you know, a pixelated video is certainly not going to draw as much attention as one that is uh, is of higher quality. So then, an obvious one and one that <laughs> we can have endless discussions about um, trying to find an answer is copyright, um, allowing for reuse in education. Um, this is difficult. It, it, it's something we can discuss further, but there's obviously a lot of issues. Um, additionally, of course, with, with AV um, around copyright clearance, um, with our broadcasters, we often find as well that maybe they have, you know, for a specific country, they have a certain licensing for their own country, but they're not able to extend that beyond, or they just don't understand, and, and this came up in um, the, the previous uh, talk as well, that they also just don't, you know, if they, it, by default, um, I believe Kirsten was saying, by default, if an audiovisual collection holder doesn't know uh, what the copyright is, then it ends up just getting labeled in copyright because you know better safe than sorry um but we just don't have you know the, the resources are often a problem time is a problem 
um, to really dig into the case, into each case and find out how um, what the actual copyright is for, for individual uh, or for collections. Um, access key uh, that, um, you know, things are, there are direct links, that it's embeddable, that stuff can actually be, you know, very readily and easily accessible. Um, and yeah, interoperability, you know, as much as possible, can things be used on different platforms um, and uh, not just, you know, locked into one kind of um, bespoke kind of uh, platform or, or functionality. So what we're working towards within the task force itself is um, to bring more diverse content uh, into the into your piano classroom. Again, a very basic kind of um, goal, but one that um, we, you know, really are working towards uh, to achieve. And we know that teachers want to use AV material. We know that they they want this kind of primary source. Um, you know, whether it's accounts of um, you know uh, news accounts or interviews or whatever the case is, AV is a really good source, a really good primary source. And we know the teachers want to be able to use this and refer to this in the classroom. So we want to be able to provide that to them as well. Um, we want to, yeah, provide, as I've said, you know, uh, interactive uh, educational tools, participatory things, things that are not just uh, watching things on a screen, but rather also engaging students um, in their own way with, you know, uh, finding ways for them to, um, be actively part of the process of, you know, looking at their history, reviewing their history, um, and understanding it. And um, ultimately then to uh, engage the students with what's happening and, and the materials that are on the site, on the European Classroom and the collections. Um, the task force is running uh, up until um, August of this year, uh, and so we're still in the middle of various different elements of it. Um, we had a really good response, so there is certainly uh, a need and a desire from the side of um, both some of our aggregator colleagues um, as well as from uh, some educators um, who showed an interest in being involved and informed and, and giving back and giving their feedback uh, into the process. So we have um, 10 kind of at the core group, we have 10 who, individuals who represent various different aggregators and interests. And we have kind of an extended group of 20 educators or people that work with, with educators um, to offer feedback and advice and um, uh, test things out for us. And the process will be that we've, we're running a series of small case studies, um, which will then lead to a white paper with recommendations for um, the further implementation and further um, showcasing of AV material in, uh, in the European classroom. So these are the various case studies. I won't go through them in detail, but um, basically there's one focusing on um, audio, one on um, the reuse of uh, digital uh, cultural content and education, um, <clears throat> copyright and IPR, which is, you know, a small, uh, a small dint in a bigger, uh, bigger discussion. Um, one focusing specifically on the media player, uh, testing it as much as we can um, and getting more direct feedback from educators and students. Um, looking to students as actual, you know, producers themselves of history and how we can get them to uh, Nicole. Um, uh, Nicole? Uh, yeah, I, we, we stopped hearing you for a bit. Oh, okay. Where should I go? Should I rewind? Uh, just uh, yeah, one sentence before, or yeah, we were here, but then uh, we were not hearing you anymore. I mean, I was not hearing you, so I think it's a common problem for everyone. Okay. But yeah, if you could go uh, uh, again well, from uh, yeah the sentence that you <laughs> mentioned before. Okay. okay. Well, I mean, just concluding the different case studies, basically. Great. Um, so uh, we had. Uh, seven, and you can see them here. There's a wide variety of different topics that come up when you talk about um, AV and education. Um, but I think it's more important just to also look at some of the challenges that we've um, that we faced in the, in the process of both uh, the task force, but also more wider. Um, 
online tools that we're using are still in development. So uh, not all the material, for example, in the media player is accessible for every collection. And that is a barrier, but it's something that we're aware of, something that we want to develop more. Um, other things such as a big one that's come up that was surprising, um, the need for kind of shared logins, you know, for classroom work, for collaborative work, whether that's on the Europeana site or on EU screen, you know, students, uh, can't or maybe shouldn't if they're too young log in themselves so a teacher would have to do that and to be able to uh, bring the classroom together um, around a, uh, you know materials they're working with on the site um, lining up with the timings of, of school curriculums and school schedules uh, of course there's summer breaks there's there's in between breaks so it's also a challenge to make sure that we're, we're falling into their curriculums and into their plans um, how do you involve students, you know, making it interesting for them? What is the motivation for them to be involved, especially kind of high school age uh, uh, at that level? So that's always a constant challenge as well. And we, um, we have some very ambitious and very great teachers, but it is, there's only so much um, that, that can be done. And as mentioned a few times, copyright is a big issue as well, a big challenge. Um, some of the things that we've learned, um, again, in the, within the task force and more, more widely, um, a word that kept coming up was trust um, and the needing to be a trusted uh, source for educators, whether that is knowing that the context um, descriptions are correct, the, the factual material is correct, but also knowing that, um, you know, there won't be any, you know, one, one teacher brought up and said that, you know, I want to make sure that no prof profanity comes up in the material or nothing that will be um, disturbing. Um, so things like that that have to be put in place to make sure that uh, our site, our material, our lesson plans, our whatever um, are, are able to be trusted by the educators. They can just pull them off the shelf and use it. Um, and which relates again, of course, also to the use of it, ease of use and integration of these tools in everyday practice. There are things that there are tools that are being used by the educators, and if it doesn't fit into what they're used to, you know, it, they won't necessarily give it a second look. Um, <clears throat> so we have to make sure we meet them where they are, and not always try to lure them to um, trying something else, something new. Um, sorry, that's that one came up again uh, with the lining up the school curriculums, but um, and again, involving students. Yeah, huge lessons. So, you know, essentially that's that's a bit of a whistle stop tour of uh, uh, EU screen and education work. Um, some of the things I, I know I just really glossed over. Uh, other things um, certainly deserve uh, more intention and more more time. But you know, we have a bit of time. We could talk a bit about um, your own experiences, your own opportunities. Um, some thoughts I had uh, around questions that you might want to consider is. Um, if you have opportunities to open up your AV content or what the challenges are that you have in doing so. Um, and just at a very basic level, um, you know, uh, familiarity with licensing options around education and, and your own connection to education and educators and collaborators. Um, some of these things I, I will have answers to, others um, uh, I won't. But um, if there is an interest, then we can certainly keep talking. and. Um, the EU screen network is open. You can join the mailing list. You can join uh, the network itself um, and talk to us about your thoughts and ideas when you share the content. And I'd be curious also to hear um, people's own, yeah, absolutely, your own experience, um, especially challenges and things and, or problems that you've had to solve. What are the benefits for content holders to join you screen? A question coming from Solki, if I pronounce it correctly, from Japan. Uh, let's see. Um, well, we hope it's uh, multifaceted, uh, multicolored uh, benefits. Um, it depends on what you want to do with your content. If you are a collection holder um, who's interested, obviously, in working with your piano, then the benefit is that we would provide that aggregation route and help you along the way with the processes, um, the various nitty gritty of getting the content ready for your piano. So that's one of the kind of main benefits as a, as a, as a member. Um, 
being part of a group of fantastic people who really care about what they're doing, uh, as well as um, attending events, um, um, you know, being part of projects, uh, capacity building activities, things like that. It, it's hopefully it's uh, it's a good it's a good selling point itself just to be part of a group of such great people and institutions. There was another remark from May. Uh, you screen activities involving students at all level is great. Will this encourage creativity among them? Will there be some technical support uh, when needed and view on IPR issues? Uh, was this a remark or a question, Maylene? I see your camera is on. Question, yes, uh, Nicole. There's a question on... Uh, yeah. If it will encourage creativity among students. I hope so. Absolutely. I hope so. Um, the project that uh, there's some things that I didn't mention, for example, some of the kind of more engagement activities that we will um, that will be part of both the subtitle project, but um, uh, is also currently part of the XX project is things like the subtitle a thon, which um, Maya mentioned earlier today as well. Um, this is really a, a great way for, you know, anyone, but more specifically language, younger language learners, people that are interested in um, history to get involved and to directly um, be part of, you know, the process of learning what it's like to subtitle a video and have a little bit of a competition in, in the process, um, hopefully is also then also engage with the material. Um, so there's kind of creative ways like that, that we want to engage people. Um, as well as also the very process of um, providing students with the means to think critically about um, <coughs> about the past and about the material that is being presented to them. Not that they automatically always go to YouTube and look for things and, and um, take what they see there as, you know, as a given, but to also think, okay, there are other sources out there. There's other ways to um, engage with uh, video material. And we hope that we can provide a little piece of that as well. And there was a second part of the question. Will there be some technical support uh, when needed and view on uh, IPR issues, Nicole? Yeah. Um, if you, do you mean specifically in students dealing with um, and engaging with material? Yeah. Um, on individual, for these individual kind of campaigns, um, definitely. Uh, it's something we have in the process that we've been looking at in the task force as well. Um, it's in, I would say it's in development, um, how we exactly will um, be able to, yeah, because we don't, we, we want to, to use a really kind of um, user experience design principle that is based on, yeah, what the students and what the teachers want and not automatically assume what they want. So there's a lot of testing and iteration as far as, okay, um, if we try it out this way, if we, you know, provide uh, something in this format or provide this kind of program, um, there was always a process of then testing and working with uh, students and providing support in that respect. Um, and IPR, again, <laughs> massive, massive question, massive issue. Um, but it, I think especially with students and young people, there's a lot of, a lot of gaps there in their knowledge around what it means. Um, that even copyright, maybe it, that it even exists, that somebody might actually, you know, own material and um, have a claim to it and they can't just use it. Um, so there is certainly a lot to be done um, uh, there to really educate students in that respect. But again, I'm not, I'm not the only expert. I mean, we have other people in the network and in the community that are much more experts about IPR um, and uh, you know, working specifically with, with students and in the classroom. If this is to kind of be about how do we reflect back to individuals and people and students um, more about their own experience and not assume kind of kind of mainstream um, uh, you know, um, representation, this is something that we take very much to heart um, and is something that we are going to be integrating into both the European subtitle project with uh, um, the kind of curatorial and editorial um, work. Um, it's also something around, you know, diverse and inclusive uh, voices that we will be um, focusing on more along with um, 
you know, the whole European initiative. I hope that I hope that was answering the question. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I was just um, just wanted to um, add something to 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 Nicole's. I, I mean, I've, I'm also on the task force, so so I'm 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 a kind of plant here. Um, and um, but um, the, the new um, there's a new function on Europeana which I really hope um, teachers and researchers will be able to use more, which is um, being able to um, like their content um, because that's a good way of um, of just bookmarking a record. You know, you see something, you've done a search, and you found something. Um, and then if by liking it, you can um, you can get hold of it again rather than think, well, I can't quite remember how how I how I how I got to that. Um, so, I mean, I think this is a really it, it, uh, I'm, I'm uh, really hoping that that um, educators um, grab hold of this uh, opportunity. And um, and so we're, we're trying to sort of encourage um teachers to 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 engage with europeana make it um uh easier for them to sort of find and hold on to um content that that they think is relevant yeah that's a good question kira um but annotations in the media player um yeah at this point no uh they are for an individual um user to use you might hear my dog in the background excuse me it's time for her walk um but the, the idea is that, again, the whole idea of maybe working towards kind of shared accounts or um, for, you know, there to be some way to maybe crowdsource around, you know, um, uh, around a collection or around, you know, as Tom's saying, also around this liking. And there are ways that we want to build more of a community in that way um, online so that annotations can be shared and subtitles can be shared. Um, you know, at least within a small group, whether it's just a classroom, but also then uh, more widely. May I add something, uh, Nicole? Yes, of course. Uh, I think that actually, technically speaking, we give the possibility to, uh, to share uh, annotated or subtitled content. The problem is, of course, that uh, this can violate, in many cases, the, uh, the copyright on the, on the object because we are actually uh, altering, in a way, the content with this annotation on top of it. So uh, it's something that, technically speaking, is, is, is very easy to, to implement. And actually, we have implemented it in the, the meta player, uh, but is, is a bit complicated to, uh, uh, to deploy uh, on, on, for example, on your screen content, but also on the audiovisual content that is in, in, in Europeana. So, for example, Istituto Lucio Cinecittà, a, 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 um, allowed the its content on your screen and on, on Europeana to be embedded, tagged, uh, I, I mean, annotated and subtitled, uh, but they can do that because uh, they are the rights holder. In many of the uh, broadcasters' archives, uh, the situation of rights is a bit complicated, so it's not so easy to to have to go to the rights holder and ask for permission. And for this reason, of course, it's uh, deep. So I think that, but this is something that we have also to discuss in the in the in the task force uh, to find a way to uh, make these tools uh, widely uh, usable by, for example, the educational community, teachers and students. So I was thinking that one possibility could be that we make these annotations and subtitles and and things leave on, for example, the Europeana portal or the screen portal only, in this case, probably provider could uh, more easily uh, allow, uh, for example, a teacher to annotate or subtitle a small clip on, on Europeana if they know that this small clip will remain in Europeana visible only by the, uh, uh, the teacher and the pupils that have the access to the is this uh, users or users on on your piano website or in your screen website so it's something that technically speaking is easy uh, from a policy perspective is a bit complicated there was a question from uh, from chiara uh, can the annotation via the media player be shared among different users 
this is exactly what we were yeah. addressing. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, sorry. I hope, I hope yeah. we yeah. apply it to the <laughs> Okay, thanks. Great. <laughs> Kirsten, you've raised your hand. Yeah, it's just, to, to, it's a question also to Mark. So if we convince the copyright owners um, to use the um, in copyright for educational use permitted label, would that be sufficient in terms of copyright? Would that would we would be we then on the safe side? Or well, in, in in theory, yes. Of course, it depends. Then the problem is that when you put the content out there, it's very yeah. difficult to uh, to say uh, okay, this is just for education. In the sense that if I embed a a resource in my MOOC, for example. Mm. Uh, then I'm pretty sure they will stay more or less there. But if I'm publishing it in a, in a, a allow, allow the, the sharing in a, I don't know, in a, a blog or whatever, then eventually these, these, mm. these embed uh, can be re-embedded in other resources uh, or things that, which are not used for educational use. So it's a bit tricky. Mm. Uh, it's always, and, and you know that, much better than me. I mean, when we go to copyright and the visual content, it's it's extremely complicated the situation. So usually, yeah. uh, you either try to not think about the issues and just face them when they come. But this is an approach that some in some cases you cannot have. It's, it's mm. too much. So, yeah, but maybe the label would protect us in a way as a problem. yeah. Of course, I mean, if uh, this is something that we would like to encourage in general, and I think, uh, like 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 Nicole said, we we are trying to encourage a, pro a provider to uh, open up the content uh, as much as they can, and and the ed 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 educational use uh, is 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 one way. As you know, in our copyright uh, uh, directive in Europe, in in, in the copyright law in Europe, there's no. Uh, fair use or exception really for education when it comes to audiovisual content. So mm -hmm. it's something that we are trying to introduce in a way, but there is no legal basis for it mm -hmm. really. So it's a, fortunately when it comes to copyright, things get very complicated. Some risk management is always good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, when to the, yeah, in that respect, uh, we are in a better situation with our content from the European Film Gateway because things are starting to become public domain. So right. It's a matter of time. So we, yeah. But on the other hand, our content is not so much interesting for young people. So we are in the other situation that we have to find a way to make it more appealing. Yeah. Thanks, Nicole, and uh, the others that have contributed. And uh, see you later. <laughs> <laughs>